All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about groups and homogeneous spaces. Uh, we're going to learn about group convolutions and steerable uh, CNNs. Uh, so the outline uh, for today is first we're going to look at group convolutions in a uh, uh, first in a little bit more intuitive way, uh, trying to picture how this operation uh, works. Uh, how we can generalize convolutional convolutions from uh, just operating by translations on the plane to uh, other transformations, such as rotations and translations uh, in the plane, uh, or continuous three-dimensional rotations on the sphere. Um, and we'll also look at some of the, the mathematics behind that. Uh, and then after we've done that, we'll look at groups and homogeneous spaces. We'll try to distill the general uh, or the common elements of these two examples uh, and develop a, a general theory that works for any so-called homogeneous space, which includes the, the plane uh, and the sphere and many other spaces. Uh, we'll look at how to define convolutions on such homogeneous spaces. Uh, and uh, we'll see actually that if you do this in a, in a naive way, uh, you end up with something fairly limited. Uh, you're forced to use so, uh, isotropic filters if you want uh, this operation to be equivariant. And then we'll look at a, a solution to that problem uh, called steerable CNNs, uh, where the inputs and feature maps can be uh, not just functions on your, uh, uh, on your manifold, like on your sphere, but uh, uh, fields. So for example, vector fields and other kinds of fields. And we'll show uh, that convolution is all you need. Uh, in the sense that uh, any equivariant linear map uh, between such spaces of fields can be written as a generalized kind of convolution. All right, so we'll begin with group convolution in the uh, simplest uh, case uh, where we look at discrete rotations and translations, so integer translations and rotations by multiples of 90 degrees. So in many uh, uh, image recognition problems, uh, you'll, you'll clearly want to be uh, equivariant to translations and also rotations. And to keep it simple, we're going to look at these discrete rotations only. Uh, so in a convolution, what we do is we take our filter and we, uh, we slide it over the image. And in this case, we have here an eye uh, filter and a, a mouth filter, mouth detector. And as we slide them over the image, uh, we'll get a strong response where the eyes are, okay? Uh, so that's a, that's a translational convolution that we're uh, familiar with that uh, was also uh, discussed, of course, in the, in the previous lecture. Uh, but now in the group convolution for this group of rotations and translations, we're not just going to translate the filter, shift it, but we're also going to apply rotation. So rotation by 90 degrees here. We convolve it again. In this case, we don't get a good response because the eye is rotated in the wrong way. And uh, we rotate another time and another time. And each time we do a translational convolution. So another way to say it is that for each element in a roto translation group, we're going to apply it to the filter and uh, compute an inner product with the, the signal to get a response. Now, something interesting happens when you do this because uh, uh, whereas a translational convolution is equivalent to translations, but not to rotations. In this case, when we rotate the input, so we get this image here, and then apply exactly the same operation, uh, you can see that the feature maps, they transform in an interesting way. So first of all, the feature maps, of course, will be rotated. So where the, these eyes, for example, in the, in the original feature maps, they were the, the, the high responses, this feature map, uh, the, uh, the peaks of this feature map were on a horizontal line. Now they're on a vertical line because the input was rotated. But something else happened, which is that whereas in the original, for the original image, the first filter, the first orientation channel uh, lit up. Now the second orientation channel lit up. So if you want to describe the transformation that happened from the feature map computed on the original image and the feature maps computed on the rotated image, uh, you have to do two things. First, a spatial rotation 
And then secondly, a cyclic shift among these orientation channels. And actually, this is one of the reasons why in our blueprint, uh, we, we need to specify a potentially different representation of our group in each layer of the network. So in the first layer of the network, we have our, our uh, RGB image, and this has one way of transforming. In that case, we just move each pixel to a new spatial location without changing the value of the pixel. But in the feature space, we also do a spatial rotation, but then in addition, there's an action on the channels. So one way to think of it is that the group is the same. We have rotations and translations, both the first layer and the second layer, but the way that it acts on the feature space is different. Uh, in this case, there's a cyclic shift in addition to spatial rotation. Um, so this is just a, a, another visualization of the same. We have our input image. We do this convolution. We get four feature maps by taking this filter, rotating it four times, spatially convolving. And when we now input to the rotated image and do the same thing, we see that this feature map here uh, is actually the same one as the feature map here in a different position, uh, but rotated. And so what that means for the, for the second and higher layers is that our filter, first of all, uh, is now going to have four input channels. You know, when you have four feature maps, uh, a single filter will have four input channels. So this is now what we can think of as one filter, essentially. Uh, and when we convolve it with these four channels, we get one output channel. So what we're going to do is we're going to, again, apply our same idea. We're going to rotate this filter four times. But now, because this filter applies to the second layer, which has this different transformation law, uh, what we have to do is we have to rotate these channels of the filter and cyclically permute them. And when we do this and we apply it to this input, we, we, uh, well, we can make these four uh, orientation channels. And you can show that, again, the output of this operation uh, has the same kind of transformation law. So again, you see this feature map here, for instance, uh, corresponds to this one. It's uh, shifted its position, so a cyclic shift among the channels and the orientation of the channel uh, changed. Um, and finally, what you could do is you could um, uh, rotate the, uh, sorry, you could do a pooling over the orientation channels. So for each spatial location, you would do a sum or a maximum over the four channels. And uh, the result would, um, uh, would be an image uh, that has the same transformation behavior as the input. So if you rotate the input, the output will also rotate. So that could be useful if you want to do, for example, semantic segmentation. Um, Right, so to relate this to the, to the blueprint, we have in the input, we have our uh, domain omega, that's Z2, the integers. We imagine this image extends infinitely far. And we have a particular way it transforms as a scalar field in this case. We'll look later at what that means, but intuitively it's just what it means to rotate an image. Then we have our hidden layers uh, where we have the domain, the group P4, that's just a name for the, the group of discrete translations and rotations. Um, so each pixel in this stack of feature maps has a, a spatial coordinate, that's a translation, and it has a channel coordinate that's the corresponds to the rotation. So in another, another way to think of these four channels is not as four orientation channels, but as a single function on this group P4. So that's our domain. And we saw how it transforms. And the way it transforms, as we'll see later, is called a regular representation. That's just a mathematical name for this uh, channel cycling uh, and spatial rotation. The other hidden layer has the same uh, properties. And finally, our output space again is the same as the input space. So this highlights some of the, the features of our, our blueprint. All right, so let's try to understand this uh, in a mathematical way. So we're going to understand group convolution by analogy to uh, translational convolution. So in the normal convolution, we compute an inner product between a signal and a translated filter. And so the output feature map is indexed by these translations. In group convolution, we're going to compute an inner product between the signal and a transformed uh, filter. 
where the transformation uh, is uh, ranges over some group that we choose. So let's make that precise. So transforming a signal uh, is, uh, is given by these equations. In the case of translation, we just translate the input coordinate. In the case of transformation, we apply our group element inverse to the input coordinate. And that's how we transform a signal X. That's one part of the word that occurs in the definition. The other is inner product. And again, we've seen this in the blueprint, an inner product between two signals is given by integrating over the domain uh, the inner product of the feature vectors at uh, each spatial position. And concretely, uh, usually this boils down to summing because you have to discretize your domain. And so in the case of, uh, let's say, one-dimensional signals and translations, we sum over the spatial positions, we sum over the uh, channels, the product of the this channel of X and this channel of Y at the corresponding positions. So then we define convolution or technically in the translational case is actually correlation, but don't worry about that. Uh, the idea is, well, we have our signal X and we're gonna take an inner product with the transformed uh, filter Psi. In the case of normal convolution, this transformation is a translation. So that's what you see here. And here you see the inner product being taken. In the case of group convolution, the equation here is exactly the same. It says take an inner product of our filter transformed by G. And uh, that's you know writing out the definition that's given by this equation. So a key observation here is that our output signal here, X convolved with Psi, is actually a function on the group. So for every group element, we'll get a response. In the case of translations, you know, the plane is essentially the same as the 2D translation group. So you don't notice this different. Every feature map in your convnet is essentially a function on the plane, but now we'll have a function on the group. Um, and so for second and higher layers, we'll have to make sure that uh, our group convolution can deal also with functions on the group. And in fact, this equation here still works for such signals. So if X is a signal on the group, and psi also, then we can define a certain action row, that's the regular representation. Um, and again, this definition still, still holds. And you can show that this is equivariant. We'll look at that later in, uh, in more detail. So let's uh, try to understand this regular representation from a, from a mathematical uh, standpoint. So we know that for the case of the translation rotation group, it basically means cyclically shifting the channels and rotating each channel. Uh, but uh, mathematically, what we want to do is we want to model this as a function on our group. Uh, and then we want to define a group action uh, on that space of signals. All right, so we recall, again, from the blueprint that we have signals on our domain, mapping from the domain to some vector space of channels. And they transform according to this equation. Um, and we note that this G inverse U, what it denotes is the action of our group G on the domain omega. So if you have a point in the plane, so if omega is the plane, G is a roto translation, then we apply this rotation translation to a point and we end up in some other point. That's what this denotes. Um, now, in the, as, as we saw in the later layers, we want to take our domain to be equal to our group. Um, and we want to apply the same idea. So now omega is our group. So we need a left action of our group G on itself. And actually there's a very simple way to do that because you say the action of this element G on another element H is just the composition in the group. You just multiply these transformations that gives you a new transformation and you can verify that this is a valid group action. So now we have a group action of G on itself. And that means we can use the same definition. Um, so that's written here. The, and it, the, the name for this thing is the regular representation. So we have a signal X. If we transform it by rho of G, we get a new signal X. And if we evaluate that at the point H, which is another element of the group, we that's the same as evaluating the original signal at G inverse H. All right, 
So that's a bunch of uh, uh, jargon, but uh, uh, the, the upshot is that we have this space of signals, functions on our group with some number of channels, and we have an action of our group on that space. And what I'm going to tell you is that in the case of the roto translation group, this is going to be, this, this uh, regular representation is going to be exactly what we saw just now, where we have the channel cycling behavior. Uh, uh, okay, so something is wrong with the buildup on this slide. Oh no, there, it's fine. Um, all right, so uh, let's look at it, this regular representation for this special case of rot discrete roto translations. So we're going to encode these elements to make it concrete as rot rotation translation matrices. So basically we have a coordinate R, little r, that's an integer zero, one, two, three, that indicates whether you're rotating by zero, 90 degrees, 180 degrees to 70 degrees. It gets folded into this two by two rotation matrix R, capital R of little r. And in addition, we have a two dimensional translation vector uh, that does an integer shift. Um, then the group operation is given by matrix multiplication. So you can work this out. If you take one element indexed by R and T and another by R prime and T prime, if you multiply the matrices, you see that actually uh, using some trigonometry, you can see that the, uh, this part, basically you just add up the, uh, uh, the rotation uh, index, of course, modulo four. Uh, so the rotations just add. And then for the translational part, you have the rotation of the first element acting on the translation of the second, uh, and you're adding the translation of the first. And similarly, there's an equation for the inverse like this. It's a good exercise to, to try this, uh, to verify this and to see that it makes sense uh, that indeed this uh, roto translation is the same as just doing this one first and then this one. Um, and so now what does this tell us about the regular representation? Well, um, we have a group here that has a rotation component and a translation component. So our row taking a group element, we can write it as a function of two arguments. And here to keep it simple, we'll set the translation to zero. And similarly, our signal is a function on this group. So it's also indexed by a rotation and a translation. And if you now use these two equations of, of, of the inverse and composition, what you'll find is that uh, according to our defin definition of regular representation, well, we have to apply R prime inverse to this group element, R comma T. Well, that just means we have to subtract R prime from our rotation index, of course, mod four, cyclic shift. And we have to rotate the translational component. And so this is where the behavior that we saw before, channel cycling plus spatial rotation, where it comes from. Um, but of course, this concept of a regular representation is very general for any group, essentially. Uh, you can consider the space of functions on this group, and you can define this action of the group on that space of functions. Um, and uh, indeed, if you do this for, for, uh, for even slightly more complicated settings, uh, you'll get much more interesting behavior. So if you have, for example, a 3D CNN that you want to make rotation equivariant, so equivariant to discrete three-dimensional rotations, um, then your channel cycling is not going to be just a simple four-fold shift, but it's gonna be some complicated permutation that's indicated by this diagram. So you see here, if you take this cube, you rotate it around the Z axis, that's the red arrow. You do that four times, you get back to the beginning. So that's a kind of channel cycling among this group of four channels. But if you apply a rotation around the diagonal axis of this cube, you'll have something with uh, where after three rotations, you get back to where you started. And if you compose these two rotations, you can make any rotation uh, in the group of symmetries of the cube. Um, and this will tell you how exactly the, the 24 ch orientation channels uh, will, uh, will be permuted in the regular representation. Um, all right, so we, we, uh, we've defined group convolution 
and we've claimed it's equivariant, but uh, and we've kind of seen that in, in one example uh, visually, but how can we actually prove that mathematically? So let's look at the setup. We have an input representation. So our input space omega one can be any space uh, that our group G acts on. Uh, and we have a representation uh, row one of G uh, defined in the usual way. And our output representation, that's the regular representation. So row two now is the group and um, uh, the equation is almost the same. Only the meaning here is that uh, we have to compose these group elements. So in the first layer of our uh, network, we have as input a signal on omega one, and we're gonna get as output a signal on the group. And in later layers, we'll have as input a signal on the group and as output also a signal in the group. So there are two kinds of group convolutions as we saw before. Um, now the key insight for equivariance uh, to prove equivariance is that matching a signal X with some transformed filter, row one of G times Psi, that's how we, uh, how we define the convolution, right? That's the same as matching the inverse transformed signal X with the original filter Y. So you can see that in this figure, if, if this is our original image, the, the uh, well, it's actually rotated, but let's take this to be the original image X. Uh, and this is our rotated filter then that's the same as um, uh, inverse rotating our image and matching with the original filter Psi. All right, so then we can use some simple, well, it's not, if you've never done this, it's actually not that simple, but uh, uh, with some algebra, we can show equivariance. So we have our signal X and we wanna apply a, a, an element H to it and then we convolve it and we evaluate the resulting feature map in the element G. So by definition, it's the inner product between our signal, the transformed X and a transformed uh, a filter Psi. Then using this property that we derived, we can move this transformation of, of, the, filter, uh, of the signal to the other side to our uh, filter. And because rho one is a representation, we can combine row one of H inverse times row one of G into one thing, row one of H inverse G. And that we recognize as taking an inner product between filter and a transformed, uh, sorry, a signal and a transformed filter, which is a convolution evaluated at this element H inverse G. And that we recognize as our regular representation applied to our feature map. So that's it. That's the proof of equivariance. Now you can show, we will not do it here, but you can prove that uh, convolution is all you need. So the informal statement is that if you have regular representations, then any, and you, you, you're asking about what is the most general kind of equivariant linear map between these regular representation? Well, you can show that this is a group convolution. So the case that we saw before that translational, uh, sorry, translation equivariant linear maps are translational convolutions. That's a special case of this for the translation group, but it, uh, it, it holds true more generally. So this is uh, actually a, a, a known, and it was already long been, has long been known in mathematics, but the first to really study this um, in the uh, machine learning literature were Condor and Trivedi. And later we generalized this to, um, to hold not just for the scalar signals that we're looking at now, but also for more general fields uh, that we'll look at later in this, uh, this lecture. Okay, so that was a, some fairly complicated mathematics, but as you can uh, see from the, the first few slides, the, the, I, the basic idea is pretty simple. You take filters, you rotate them in some way, and then you do a translational convolution. At least that's how you do it for the roto translation group. So to implement that, <clears throat> basically you do two steps. So you have a bunch of weights. These are the, the weights of uh, your filters. Um, and then you have a bunch of indices that will essentially copy the weights multiple times in some rotated way. Uh, so this is a step we call filter transformation. We take one filter, we make four filters 
out of it by rotating we're using some pre-computed indices that gives us a bigger filter bank and we simply apply conv to d the usual convolution uh, to the input feature maps using that uh, transform filter bank and that gives us our output feature maps so this is really simple uh, and uh, you can actually see that it's not that much compute overhead uh, indeed if once you're done training, you can do this operation once, and now you get a larger filter bank uh, with uh, where certain values happen to be the same. Uh, you have some weight sharing, and you just uh, apply that to conv2d in the forward pass. Uh, so at test time, basically, you're just running a normal convolutional network. So to sl slightly better understand this filter transformation, I've uh, made a uh, visualization here. So the, the weights, indicated in yellow here, uh, they look like this. Uh, the, uh, we have uh, four uh, orientation channels. So this is for a second layer group convolution or higher. Uh, so we have four input channels and the colors indicate that the weights here are not shared. So all the weights at each position and in each channel, they're free parameters. Then there's a filter transformation step. And what it does is it um, makes four copies of this uh, of these four filters or this one filter with four input channels and what it does is it well again what we said uh, we rotate each channel and we cyclically shift so if we do that one once we get the second row twice third row and then the fourth row and together this forms a feature ba bank with four input channels four output channels and some spatial uh, dimension so there are a number of other approaches. So there's steerable CNNs that we'll look at later in this lecture, um, where this generalizes the group convolution to, to handle arbitrary kinds of fields. And this is useful because whereas in the group convolution, uh, the number of orientation channels will grow with the size of the group. In the case of a steerable CNN, this need not be the case. You will always work, for example, on the plane uh, if you're doing a uh, rotation equivariant uh, planar CNN. Uh, then there are B-spline CNNs uh, where they define continuous filters using uh, B-splines. And these filters, they live in the tangent space or so-called Lie algebra of your group. Uh, so this is a very general technique that works for any uh, differentiable group, any Lie group, including rotations and scaling and, and other kinds of uh, transformations. Um, there's also LeCom, which has a similar idea, uh, but instead of using B splines, they use an MLP to parameterize the filter, a multi-layer perception, um, and they use a certain point comb trick to make this uh, efficient. There's also work on scale equivariance using either semi-group convolution over scale pyramid uh, or uh, using steerable filters. And actually, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's, there's a, a very large literature uh, um, on group convolutions and generalizations now. And one of those uh, actually sub areas that, that is uh, getting very big is uh, the area of spherical CNNs. So spherical signals, they arise in many domains like earth and climate sciences uh, or omnidirectional vision, also in cosmology and many other uh, scientific domains. And so we would like to apply convolutions to that. Uh, but as you can see here, the, if you just uh, you know, project this to the plane and you apply a, a planar CNN, that's not going to work because the features um, are represented very differently depending on uh, uh, where on the sphere they are. There's a, there's a large amount of distortion here. So you want a CNN that works intrinsically on the sphere and is equivariant to rotational symmetries. So this we can do uh, using something called spherical and SO3 convolution which is really just the same idea as we saw before, but just for different space, the sphere instead of the plane and a different group, namely SO3, the group of three-dimensional rotations. So in the imp input space, we have an input uh, X, that's a signal on the sphere S2, uh, and a filter Psi that's also a signal on the sphere. And the group convolution is something that now outputs a signal on SO3 on the rotation group, and it works according to our prescription. Take an inner product of a signal and a transform filter, which now means integrate over the sphere the inner product of a feature vector at U, 
and the uh, feature vector of the filter, the transformed filter uh, at, uh, yeah, at G inverse U. Um, and for the second layer, the, the equation is almost the same, only now, again, we uh, don't have the domain S2, but we have the domain SO3. And the group action here is just the action of the rotation group on the sphere. So moving, rotating a point on the sphere. And here is the, uh, well, the regular representation of SO3. So involving the, uh, here, the, uh, the group composition. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, um, but it uh, turns out that also for this kind of generalized convolution, this group convolution, you could, you can, uh, uh, there, there's a whole spectral theory. So we saw for the case of translational convolutions that uh, we can execute the, the convolution in the spectrum. So to, using Fourier transforms uh, as, a, as a pointwise product. Um, and this kind of generalizes to the general case. Uh, only now, because this because these groups typically are not commutative, the convolution is also not commutative. So psi convolved with x is not x the same as x convolved with psi. Um, and uh, so it turns out that your spectrum, you should not think of that as a list of uh, or a vector of complex numbers, but as a block diagonal matrix with blocks of different sizes. And now the convolution in the spectrum uh, for the first layer where you have a, a spherical signal, two spherical signals indexed by alpha and beta to, to spherical coordinates. Uh, you apply a generalized Fourier transform, you get a list or a vector uh, that uh, co consists of some uh, components of one, three, five, seven dimensions. You take an outer product and you get a matrix and that matrix you can interpret as the spectrum of a signal on uh, SO3, the rotation group. So you apply an in, you take a product of those matrices and then an inverse Fourier, SO3 Fourier transform to get your uh, uh, SO3 uh, signal. Um, very, this is not something, I'm, I'm not explaining why this is the case. I'm just pointing out that there is this generalization it has some uh, uh, some surprising, perhaps, uh, features, and there's a very interesting mathematics behind it. So if you're interested, have a look at that. Uh, we have references uh, in the papers uh, below. Uh, but for the rest of the talk, you uh, uh, you, you won't have to understand uh, this uh, this aspect. So again, there are a number of uh, uh, other ways to, to implement this, uh, aside from the spectral approach. Uh, first, there's, uh, there's one generalization that actually still uses the spectral approach, but now uh, they, they, use a they find a convolution that takes as input signals on the sphere and as output also signals on the sphere. But the price that they have to pay, as we'll see also later in this lecture, is that the filters, uh, in this case, have to be isotropic, in, so rotation invariant, in order to, uh, to make this convolution operation equivariant. Uh, but it has some computational advantages because now you can work on the two-dimensional sphere instead of having three-dimensional feature maps on SO3. Uh, another approach, uh, deep sphere, uh, basically makes uh, two contributions. So the, the first one is that they use a Helpix grid. So this is a grid developed in, I think, uh, cosmology, uh, which has a much more evenly spaced uh, sampling of, of points. Uh, compared to the grids that were used in, in, uh, in earlier works. Um, and the second thing they do is they, they connect nearby pixels uh, to form a graph, and then they just apply a graph convolution. So it's a graph neural net of the convolutional type. Uh, and uh, that means that all the edges use the same weights. So in other words, you can think of this as also using isotropic filters. And so they show that in the limit of a dense sampling grid, uh, this operation will also be rotation equivariant. And then there's a whole line of work on spectral spherical CNNs, uh, mainly by uh, uh, the group of Rizi Kondor and, and colleagues, um, where instead of working with these spatial signals on the sphere, you work completely uh, in, the, in the spectrum using these uh, generalized Fourier transforms that I, that I mentioned before. 
And then, again, there are many other works uh, that, uh, that are also very interesting, but didn't fit on this slide. All right, so now we've seen two examples and we've seen that actually the, the math behind it is, uh, is fairly um, a generic. So it turns out that we can actually form a general theory of uh, group convolutional nets on homogeneous spaces. So what's a homogeneous space? <clears throat> so uh, again, from our blueprint, uh, we, we always work with a domain omega, that's a set. Maybe it has some structure, like it could be a manifold. Um, and uh, it carries some action of our group G. Now, if this action is transitive, meaning that for any two points U and V in the domain, there's at least one element G in our group such that uh, G U equal V. So it ma G maps U to V. If that's the case, if we can relate any two points by a symmetry, then we we'll say that omega is a homogeneous space for this group G. So here's some examples. We have the plane and the translation group. And if you take any arbitrary two points, we can of course find a translation that maps one to the other. So the plane is a homogeneous space for the translation group. Similarly, the sphere is a homogeneous space for the rotation group. Any two points can be rotated into each other. Here's a non-example. So the plane is not a homogeneous space for the two-dimensional rotation group. So rotations around the center point only, they can map a point on this circle to another point on this circle, but two points on different circles cannot be mapped into each other by a rotation. And so this is not a homogeneous space, although, as is actually always the case, uh, this space splits into a number of orbits, these circles, and the orbits themselves are uh, homogeneous spaces. So any space with a group action, roughly speaking, you can think of as consisting of a whole bunch of homogeneous spaces put together. So that's actually why we study homogeneous spaces, uh, uh, why that's, that's usually enough. Uh, because if you understand the homogeneous case, then you can easily uh, uh, understand the non-homogeneous case by just putting to together a bunch of, uh, of homogeneous spaces. All right, so if we want to understand uh, or characterize a particular homogeneous space, the most important thing, uh, it actually, the, the, the Aside from the symmetry group, the only thing that we need to characterize it, as we'll see later, is something called the stabilizer subgroup. So we have our space omega, we assume that it's homogeneous. Then the stabilizer subgroup of some point U, maybe the north point, the north pole of our sphere or the point zero, zero in our plane, is the set H sub U which is the set of all transformations in our group that leave you unchanged. So le let's look at examples. We have this point in the plane. If our group is the translation group, then basically every transformation except the identity, the zero translation will move this. If our group is SE2, the rotation and translation group, then any rotation around this point will leave this point invariant. So in this case, the stabilizer is the subgroup of all rotations around this point, which is <clears throat> uh, uh, as an abstract group, that's the group SO2. Similarly for the sphere, if we pick any point, the, uh, then the stabilizer of that point is going to be SO2. It's going to be all the rotations around the axis through this point. Now you can show that uh, the stabilizer subgroup as defined here is indeed a subgroup. So you check all the axioms of a group, identity is in there, uh, uh, composition is associative, uh, it's closed under products and inverses. Um, and uh, one interesting thing is that the stabilizer of any point in omega is the same as an abstract group. So if we take this point, the stabilizer is the set of rotations around this point. If you take another point, the stabilizer is the set of rotations around that point. And as abstract groups, they're both isomorphic as it's called to SO2. Um, so 
in order to show that our space is uh, that, that our homogeneous space is characterized by this group G and the stabilizer subgroup, we're going to study something called cosets and quotients. So <clears throat> the setup is we have a group G and a subgroup H, um, you sometimes subject to some regularity conditions, but we're, we're not going to be so precise today. Um, then a left coset of this subgroup H in G is a set of this form. So it's G multiplied by every element of H. So a combination of this element G times an element little h in our group big H. Uh, all right, so let's try to understand what that means. So here we see again the group of symmetries of a triangle. And here's the multiplication table for that group. It has uh, six elements. And if you multiply, for example, R by M, you get something called M. That's, that turns out to be equal to MR squared. So this tells you the group operation. Um, here we see the Cayley diagram. And what I've done now is I've chosen this triangle to be the identity. Uh, this is the sort of canonical tri triangle. So that's the, it corresponds to the identity element. And the arrows, they mean if we follow this arrow, we're essentially right multiplying by R. Uh, and if we follow the red arrow, we're right multiplying by M. Now, the coset of... Okay, so first of all, let's look at a subgroup. So there's a subgroup EM, subgroup of flips. It's a subgroup because it has the identity element and it's closed under composition. If we take E times M, that's M, multiply again by M, that's E, uh, and in, it's also closed on the inverse. So this is a, these two elements together, they form a subgroup. So let's take that to be H. Then the cosets, they look like this. You can work that out as an, as an exercise uh, that if you multiply this set by any by uh, let's say the element r then you end up in this set if you multiply by r squared you end up in this set and so these are the three cosets of this uh, subgroup now there are a couple of things that are important to understand uh, first for any uh, element h in our subgroup and any any element g in our main group uh, we have different ways of writing the, the, the coset GH. So here we have this coset GH. So let's say G is uh, maybe the identity. Uh, so then GH is this uh, coset. And H is an element of our subgroup. So let's take that to be M. Then we have the element E times M. Um, and if you multiply it by H, we again get this same set. Uh, so the point here is that this coset can be written as either EH or MH. And the E and the M, you can call them coset representatives. They're the elements of this, this coset. Um, furthermore, if you have any two cosets, let's say this one, the coset uh, with E in it, and this one, the coset with R in it. So any, if, if, if you have two of these, co oh, sorry, no. If you have two cosets and they're equal, so let's say the coset with E in it and the coset with M in it, then there always exists an element in your subgroup such that uh, right multiplying by this element uh, relates one coset representative to the other. So in this case, uh, e, e, EH equals MH, and indeed, if we multiply E by M, we get M. And this is true always for any uh, coset. <clears throat> and so finally, the key, key observation is that any two cosets, G and G prime, indexed by G and G prime, are either identical or disjoint. So the coset MR squared H and RH are identical. Those are just two different ways to indicate the same cosets. And the coset RH and the coset EH, those are disjoint, so they don't overlap. So in other words, the cosets partition the group. Uh, here's another visualization of this uh, with some, some exercises uh, uh, asking you to, to say uh, which, uh, uh, which color are various uh, uh, cosets. And I'll leave that uh, for, for you to study uh, after the lecture. So then we get to this concept of quotients. 
So here you see another Cayley diagram. This one is actually for the cube, uh, sorry, for the uh, uh, square instead of the triangle. Uh, has a very similar structure, it has rotations and flips. Uh, and um, this, uh, we can again form cosets. So here we see the cosets of the rotation group. One is the coset of the identity, that's the rotation group itself. And then the other is the rotation combined with a flip or mirror transformation. And to take a quotient means to just forget the distinction between all of these elements inside the coset. So basically the set of all cosets, that's what we call the quotient. In this case, we have the yellow and the red coset. And so the quotient space has two elements. So one way to think of it, this is that our group of rotations and reflections is like a product of the rotation group and the reflection group. And if we quotient, if we divide by the rotations C4, uh, we end up with just the reflections. So that's why it's called a quotient. Another example we can form, here we formed the, the cosets of the rotation group. We can also form the cosets of the, the uh, reflection group. So now you have four cosets you quotient uh, by this subgroup and you end up with something that has four elements. That's the quotient space. And then a key example that uh, plays a role in spherical CNNs is the quotient of SO3, the three-dimensional rotation group by SO2. So, um, and it turns out that this gives you uh, the quotient space, you can think of that as a sphere. So SO3, you can think of that, uh, well, how do you identify a rotation? We well, choose an axis. That's like almost like picking a point on the sphere and then an angle, how much you rotate around that axis. So you can kind of draw it. It's a little bit misleading, but you can kind of draw it like this as a sphere with a bunch of circles on top of it. Um, each point on the circle indicates this particular rotation around this axis. So to understand what this means, that, that this quotient equals the sphere, you can look at the so-called Euler angle parameterization of a rotation. It says that any rotation G can be written as a rotation around the Z axis by gamma, followed by a rotation around the Y axis by beta in zero to pi, and then uh, another rotation around the Z axis. Um, now, if you consider the SO2 subgroup of Z axis rotations, so just the Z gamma for any gamma in zero to two pi, uh, then uh, you see that <clears throat> the, the coset, if you multiply this G by this H, will basically be just be indicated by alpha and beta. And the gamma uh, kind of uh, uh, becomes, uh, well, uh, irrelevant. So it's, it's uh, alpha and beta combined with any gamma, that's a coset. So that corresponds to one of these circles here. And then if we do this quotient, i.e. if we look at the space, uh, the set of cosets, so all these circles, well, that's just gonna be the sphere. It's a very intuitive attempt at, you know, at, attempt at making this intuitive, uh, but uh, um, you can read more about this in, in the various uh, references uh, in this deck. All right. Um, so we're, we're going to see that this space G over H, this quotient space uh, is essentially the same as a homogeneous space and that any homogeneous space is essentially a quotient space. So the final element uh, or ingredient that we need is we need an action of our group G on this uh, quotient space. So we take an element G, uh, a group element, and we take a coset U, uh, uh, with, uh, which is represented by this group element A then uh, we can define an action of this group on the quotient space as follows by just saying, well, we have this coset represented by A. We can just multiply A by G. That gives us a new coset representative. And so this is the, the new coset uh, that, uh, that you get by multiplying by G. Now in this definition, we used this coset representative A. And as we saw before, a single coset has multiple representatives. This one has the representatives R and RM, rotation and mirror. Um, and so you want that this definition doesn't depend on which one you choose. So if we take this coset and we apply a rotation, uh, it will give us this, this coset. 
Uh, and actually, it turns out it doesn't matter whether you use this one as a representative or this one. But that's a, an interesting exercise to, to show. All right, so we have our uh, space G over H and we have an action on it. And now we're ready to see that actually these, what we've constructed now, these quotient spaces are essentially the same thing as homogeneous spaces up to a choice of base form. So first we show that a quotient space is homogeneous with a stabilizer H. So what we have to show is that if you take any two points U and V, two cosets, two elements of our quotient space, then we can map one to the other using uh, an element of our group. And indeed you can verify if you multiply these things, uh, the coset represented by A and the coset represented by B, then B A inverse will map one to the other. And so because we did not put any assumption on U and V, we can map any U to any V uh, uh, in this space. So G over H, so the action is transitive and that makes G over H into a homogeneous space. And as I said before, the key thing about a homogeneous space that characterizes it is the stabilizer subgroup. So let's look at that. Let's take first the uh, a base point. Let's take the uh, coset of the identity, EH. Um, that's just the same as H, but uh, we'll write E there for, uh, for consistency. Then if you take any element of our subgroup H that we quotiented out, uh, then uh, um, because H is already in this subgroup capital H by the closure action, uh, this will leave this coset invariant. It will just move you to a different point in the coset, but as a set, uh, it's invariant. So we see that H is the stabilizer subgroup of this point of our quotient space. Um, and you can see that for any other point, the, uh, the stabilizer is, uh, is the same. Um, so the upshot here is we start with a group G and a subgroup H. We can form the cosets, collapse the cosets to get the quotient space. And then we have a group action uh, of G on this quotient space. We see that this group's action is, uh, is uh, transitive, uh, meaning any point can be mapped to any other. And uh, it has a stabilizer subgroup H that we quotiented. And you can also do the reverse procedure. I'll leave that as an exercise because we're running a bit uh, short on time, but you can see that any homogeneous space is essentially like a coset space with a, uh, uh, if, you, if you choose a, 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 some distinguished origin or base point. Um, so one example is sets and sequences. So this is uh, what uh, Petar covered in uh, his lectures. Our domain is a set. Uh, of, uh, of numbers one to n, let's say, and we have the permutation group. First of all, we want to see that this is a homogeneous space. Well, we can, of course, uh, map any point in this space to any other by swapping them. Well, that's a permutation. Um, and we saw that any homogeneous space is a quotient space. So which one is this? Well, what's the stabilizer? Well, you pick a point, let's say one, and the subgroup that leaves it invariant. It's another exercise. Think about what, which permutations leave the point one unchanged. What group is that? Well, by the, the previous analysis, whatever it is, we know that omega is our permutation group quotiented by the stabilizer, uh, which means that the size of these two things is the same and that the action uh, is the same. Um, then here's a very important uh, observation that we'll use later. Uh, if we have a function f on our group, let's say it's a, it's a feature map in our group convolutional net in one of the higher layers. It's a function on our group, right? If this function has the following property, that is right h invariant, which means that if we have f evaluated at this element g and we write multiply by any h in our subgroup. Um, so for instance, if we have this SO3 here, and if this, if, if for every point on this thing, we have a value that's a function on SO3. If this value is constant on these circles, uh, well, then you can see that it's essentially the same as a function on the quotient space. So 
f of g can be expressed in terms of some function f on the quotient space uh, like this. I hope that's uh, somewhat clear. Um, yeah, uh, we're gonna skip this. Um, so now we get to convolution uh, on spheres and other homogeneous spaces. So what we wanna do is we want to define a spherical convolution that takes this input two spherical signals and outputs one spherical signal. So that's like this paper of uh, Estevez that uh, I mentioned before. Um, so by the analysis on the previous slide, uh, this is equivalent to a convolution uh, that takes spherical signals and gives you a signal in SO3, the one we, we defined before. Uh, except that now this output should be SO2 invariant. Um, because an SO2 invariant uh, function on SO3 is the same essentially as a function on SO3 over SO2, which we saw was equal to the sphere. So we want a convolution that outputs a function on this object here, SO3, but that's constant on these circles. Uh, and if that's the case, then we can just think of it as a function on the sphere. Now, it turns out that if you want to achieve this kind of uh, constancy or invariance property, you need your filters to be SO2 symmetric. So basically isotropic as shown here in the, in the top right. And this logic applies more generally to uh, arbitrary homogeneous spaces. All right, so we've seen that if we want to convolve on our homogeneous space like the sphere, we need to use these isotropic filters, invariant filters. Um, we can also work on the group G, which uh, as we'll see later is actually the same as working on G over H, but using so, something called regular features. Uh, in that case, we have unconstrained uh, filters. So that's much more flexible. Uh, that's preferable from a modeling perspective, but it can be computationally costly because now this number of uh, filters grows with the size of your group H. So it turns out there's something in between where you have some constraint on your filters, not as stringent as this isotropic uh, thing, but uh, more flexible. Um, and not, not as computationally intensive as this uh, regular uh, version. Um, and uh, this involves not working not with scalar functions on your uh, homogeneous space, let's say your sphere, but with other kinds of fields. And these fields, they transform not according to the regular representation, but something called the induced representation. So here we are again looking at our regular representation and we're going to see how that's an example of an induced representation. So we look at a vector of, with four dimensions uh, and we look at the cyclic shifting behavior that we studied. So we have the group C4, uh, ro uh, fourfold ro uh, rotations and the regular representation of this group will just cyclically permute the coefficients of this vector like this. So to go from this representation of C4, that's our subgroup H, our stabilizer, to a representation of the whole roto translation group, what we do is we combine the action of the rotation and translation group on the, uh, on the plane in this case, on our uh, uh, quotient space G over H. So that moves features from one position to another, in this case, from this corner, rotating it to another corner. We combine it with this uh, representation of C4 that does the cyclic shifting. So that's a general recipe that works not just for the regular representation of C4, but also other representations. So in particular, if you have an RGB image, well, each pixel, it transforms in a trivial way. It transforms according to the trivial representation, which just does nothing for every group element. You can check this is still a valid representation, it satisfies the actions, but it's trivial. And if we then form the induced representation, well, you have the spatial action and then a trivial action on the channels. And so that's exactly how an RGB image transforms. A more interesting example is when you take an RGB image and on each channel, you perform a gradient uh, computation. So spatial derivative, you can think of this as a, some kind of vector field. Um, then here we have again, our representation induced from the trivial representation. Here we have a representation induced from 
uh, uh, the, the two-dimensional rotation representation. So each feature, the X, Y coordinates for the red, green, and blue channel, uh, they will undergo a rotation by a two by two matrix. So here's a way to visualize that. If we have a vector field like this and we want to rotate it, it's not enough to just move each vector to the rotated position, 90 degree rotated, uh, while leaving the, uh, the direction of the vectors the same. You also have to change the direction. So from horizontal here to vertical here. So the equation looks more like this. You rotate the spatial component and do something to the channels using a representation rho of your subgroup H, in this case, rotations. Uh, so that can be generalized. I'm not going to define it now, but you can, you can uh, have a look at this and, and uh, uh, look up this concept uh, on the internet or one of the references in this slide deck. But it's a general concept. We have a group G, a subgroup H, and a representation rho of H that tells you how the features transform. And from that, you can, uh, you can see how a field of features uh, that transform according to rho, uh, uh, how, they, how they transform. So neural networks that can take as input and produce as output uh, feature maps uh, that transform according to an induced representation, i.e. fields, are called steerable CNNs or sometimes harmonic networks and tensor field networks. So here you see an example of a network that takes a scalar field as input on the top and produces a scalar field and a vector field as output. And as you can see, as the input is rotating, so does the output. So there's an equivariant net. Um, and again, there's a universality theorem, uh, at least layer-wise. So uh, it's almost the same as before, only now it says that any linear equivariant map between two induced representations, so mapping from one space of fields to another space of fields, is a convolution with something called a steerable kernel. So we'll look at one example. Um, actually, in the interest of time, I'm also going to be quick here. So it basically just says, uh, in the case of uh, rotations and translations acting on the plane, that you will just do a normal convolution, but your kernel has to satisfy a certain kernel constraint, which says that if you rotate your filters, that's the same as conjugating by the representations row one and row two that correspond to the input and output space. Um, and um, here we, we study this for an example that we're familiar with, namely where we take the regular representation of C4, group of fourfold rotations. And we see, if you look at this um, filter bank that we saw in the beginning of the talk, um, it has the property that if we rotate each channel, so that's what's on the left-hand side of the equation, we rotate each channel, well, then we get this, this thing here, right? So all the Fs, all the uh, filters here are just rotated 90 degrees. But this is the same as what we get if we start here and we just cyclically shift among the uh, input and output channel dimension. So if we take this one, for example, um, and we shift it one by one step to the right and by one step down, uh, uh, well, then, uh, well, actually, we should shift the other way. But the point is, if you shift by one step uh, along the rows and the columns, you go from here to here. So that, what that means is this, uh, this uh, uh, filter bank with weight sharing indicated by the colors uh, satisfies the equivariance constraint. And so this is indeed a kernel that you can use for a steerable convolution. Now you can use this to classify uh, different GCNNs by the group G, this subgroup H, which then determines what space you're working on. Is that the plane? Is it the sphere? What else? And what types of features rho uh, you're using? How do they transform? Do they transform by cyclic shifts? Do they transform like a vector, like continuous rotation? Do they uh, tr uh, transform in a trivial way, like a, a, a RGB image? Um, and so you see that uh, actually this is already quite dated. This is from 2018, uh, but 
you can see that a lot of methods that have been presented in the literature can be understood in this uniform framework uh, that we call homogeneous GCNNs. So this is the, was actually the first step towards this unification program that we're working on, um, uh, uh, which uh, now we have extended beyond just homogeneous spaces uh, uh, to also include other manifolds and, and other uh, structures. All right, um, so a lot of content today. I hope uh, uh, it was uh, not uh, too fast, but uh, this is a, a vast topic. And so I uh, highly recommend to, uh, uh, to read up on the various references uh, that I uh, have linked to in the, in the presentation. And uh, I hope I've uh, at least uh, 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 made you a little bit curious about this, uh, this area. So uh, thanks, uh, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Taku. I think um, there are a few questions in the chat. Yeah, sure.